Hello, fellow historians. In this lecture, we take a brief look at Mexico's first civilizations. And one of the very first civilizations um, around the world occurred in Mexico. And this lecture is given in the context of Chicano identity um, as we look at the Olmecs, Mexico's first civilization and really a foundation for, in many ways, Chicano identity. Because as we looked at in our previous lecture, what is culture? Um, culture includes heroes, myths, religion, and history, and even history reaching far back into ancient times. The Olmecs. The Olmecs are Mexico's first civilization, what we call the pre-classic period, roughly around 1200 BCE before the Common Era to around 400 BCE. Now, of course, there are lots of gray areas. We don't know exactly for sure when this occurs, but that's, that's a rough estimate of um, when the Olmec civilization flourishes. Now, when we say civilization, that includes several aspects and this occurs around the world, in China, in Mesopotamia, and here in the modern state of Veracruz and Tabasco, we see um, this, this, this first civilization in the Western Hemisphere um, thriving. And a major aspect of civilization is the planting of seeds and the raising of crops. Also, the erection of buildings, uh, a religious center, um, a stratification of professions. Think about this. What are some of the major um, fundamental professions of early civilizations? What do you think? What comes to mind when you think of early civilizations? If this were a regular class and we were in the classroom, I would take, ask you to get out a piece of paper and, um, and think about this. Of course, right? Rulers, kings, emperors, god kings, especially at this time, up until very recently, rulers were seen as gods on earth or as gods chosen. Armies. If you have a civilization and you're growing foodstuffs and you're storing that food, for the coming winter. And you, you begin to accumulate things as your civilization grows. Precious metals, silver, gold, and other valuable items that people want. And all, all around you are other tribes, other peoples who do not have what you have. And they're gonna to try to take it. So what other professions arise during this time in early civilization, besides rulers, kings, queens, royal families, armies, right? Armies are needed to protect the civilization. Religion um, evolves during this early civilization period. It goes from being an animistic, um, shaman-based shaman, shaman type of religion we see um, throughout um, the Western Hemisphere, and animistic means, um, the word goes back to the, the Latin word animus, which means a spirit. So um, early type of spirituality around the world sees a spirit in everything. There's a spirit in the river, there's a spirit in the lake, there's a spirit for the trees, there's a spirit for the wind. Everything has a spirit. During this transition to civilization, um, spirits become anthropomorphized. They, be, they take on human forms. And they, they, become, they become nationalistic. We see this happening in the Old Testament, right? With the ancient Hebrews. We see this happening in Athens, in Rome, Roma. God's taken on human form, and they, they protect the civilization, and they, they take on the identity of the civilization. Athena and Athens, Roma and Rome. Um, and we see God's taking on form in the early Olmec period that will later become major gods. We have, we have a dragon god, 
We don't know what the Omics called him. We know that later on, he is Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan to the Maya. But we see him appearing first with the Omics as gods take on form. Now, as we go back way in time, the, Ol the Omics did not leave us any written record. So we have a, lots of guessing to do based on what they left us. And we have to guess at what these artifacts mean. So let's go ahead. So again, this is, I already said these two major points, 1200 BCE to 400 BCE. 400 BCE um, corresponds roughly to around um, the minor prophets in the Old Testament as we lead up to the New Testament. And there are two major sites here with the Olmecs. One at San Lorenzo, you see down here. This is the Veracruz region, Tabasco and Veracruz region of Mexico. San Lorenzo, of course, the Olmecs did not call their town San Lorenzo. That's obviously Spanish. This is something to pay attention to when you study history. Many of the terminologies and words we use to describe past peoples is something that was imposed later on and, and not necessarily something that they um, called themselves. The Greeks did not call themselves Greeks. The Romans called them Greeks. The Greeks called themselves Hellenes. Interesting, isn't it? The Aztecs they didn't call themselves Aztecs. They were the Mexica. That's where we get the modern word in Mexico, a Mexico, from the Mexica. Um, so, of course, San, San Lorenzo, the, the, the Olmecs did not speak Spanish. We have, we have no idea what they spoke. We can only guess. We don't have any, of course, we, of course, we don't have any recordings, but we don't have any written language either. And also, La Venta is another um, major um, urban center um, for the Olmecs. Right here, we see down in the, the red square in the legends um, what this area is in Mexico, right? When you have this curve up. Um, consequently, this is where Cortez lands in Veracruz, right? The true cross. He plants a cross on the beach and calls it the true, true cross. And that's where Cortez lands in 1519. We'll cover that later. But these, these dots, these yellow dots, are the major um, urban centers where the Olmecs, the Olmec civilization thrived. San Lorenzo, La Venta, Tres Zapotes, Laguna de los Cerros. So these major areas. And also, again, if this were a regular class, I would ask you to get out a piece of paper and think about this for about five minutes. The Olmecs, one of the, I would say not one of the, but the most distinguishing feature, artifacts, that the Olmecs have left us, at least giant heads. This, is, this head is over nine feet tall. It was carved out of rock. And we have several of these that the Olmecs left us. What do you think? What does this head represent? Of course, this is powerful. And a little sidetrack, when we think about the artifacts that the Mesoamericans have left us, whether it's these Olmec heads or statues, effigies of Quetzalcoatl, Cucucan, Huitzilipochtli, Tetzalipoca, they were carved and sculpted in powerful ways. These gods, or whatever these heads are, they commanded respect. They were powerful, they were large, they were heavy, they were monstrous, huge. So if you were alive at this time, they would have commanded respect. What do they represent to you? Your, your guess is probably as good as any other professor looking at these. Of course, they're more educated on the subject, but you, you, all, you all are smart students. If they can think critically about what these may have represented at the time. 
most likely they would have been painted. And keep that in mind also, when you look at ancient artifacts, whether it's from Greece or Rome or Tenochtitlan or the Olmecas, um, and we see marble or rock, um, most of these items would have been painted. Right? If you went back 2,000 years ago to Rome, you wouldn't see marble everywhere. You would, you, you would see marble painted red and blue and vibrant colors. When you watch movies in ancient Rome and they show all this marble uh, on the outside of the buildings, um, those buildings would have paint, been painted in vibrant colors. The same with um, ancient Mexico. So think about what these heads represent. What do you think? Imagine yourself, you're from another tribe, and this is, I always, I think about this often. Think about what it would have been like to have been an Olmeca, an Olmec. And you are the only civilization in the whole Western Hemisphere. The only one with the city, with cities. You're the first one. What was that like? What was it like to be from another tribe? And I just, I use the word tribe loosely. I'm not, who knows what they called themselves back then, but from another people looking through the jungle or the brush and looking at the old mech cities and looking at these giant heads. What kind of effect would that would have had on you as a nomad looking at this weird thing, this city and these giant heads? Do you think that, what kind of an effect that would, would these heads have had on those who weren't Olmec? Maybe terror, definitely respect. We look at it and it's a stone head. They may have looked at it and thought this is a god or the gods made these. This is, this is, this is imbued with some power. There's a, there's a spiritual power here. However they thought about it. I think, I think there was. A, they, they would have thought about this, these sculptures at that time in, in those ways. We look at this and we call it art, don't we? But it wasn't art. It was a function of their worldview. This is a representation of how they view their society. Whether this was a god or a king or perhaps a ball player or a, a famous warrior. No matter what, a king, a god king, a soldier, maybe all those things at once, he would have commanded respect. This would have been a place of, in, of intense religious um, power to these people, knowing, and I say that knowing what other cultures around the world, how they also evolved and the types of objects they created and, and how they viewed these objects imbued with the intense, powerful religious spirituality and power. If you can describe this expression in one word, what would you say? Think about that. Say it out loud. Write it down. What kind of expression does this person have? What's on his head? What is that? It's some kind of helmet. You see in the sides of his head, there's these um, shin guards. This is definitely a functional helmet, whether it's a crown or a military helmet. To me, it looks like a military helmet, but I could be wrong. Perhaps it's even... Um, a ball helmet, like the early foot, leather football helmets that were used in the United States, right, in the early 20th century. The Olmecs create the first team, the, the first team sport in the world was created by the Olmecs, the first team sport, a ball game. So perhaps it's a, a helmet. Um, what do you think? Another, we have several of these, again, um, some are still on site, but many of them are, are in are museums. This one is about six feet tall. You see on this helmet there at one time, this was a carved design on his head. 
what kind of civilization create, created these heads? What, what, do the, what can these heads tell us about the Olmecs? Think critically. Can you say anything about the civilization if, if we only had these heads? What was their purpose? Do they have multiple purposes? Perhaps these heads deified their, their dead rulers. We know that that's the case throughout the world, right? Um, civilization societies um, erect monuments to dead rulers. We do it now in the United States. Perhaps this was one of the first instances of a culture, a civilization, erecting a statue to a dead ruler that then is deified and seen as a religious object. But also perhaps they were placed at the border of their urban centers to ward off would-be attackers. Perhaps. Powerful. Another. They all have a stern look on their face, don't they? They're, very, they're serious. Um, they're powerful. His brow, look at his brow. You don't want to mess with this guy. And his helmet looks like um, woven cotton or leather. It certainly looks like something that was used to protect him. And I'm saying that because, again, of the shin guards. What do you think? The Olmec civilization at La Venta. The Great Pyramid is about 110 feet tall, volcano shape, of course, as um, pyramids are. The Olmec heads, we have 17 in total. There are 17 Olmec heads. There's four at La Venta, ranging in size from about four feet to about 10 feet tall made of basalt. They most likely represent mighty Olmec rulers. And this is what I think too. And also not just a guess by looking at the Olmec civilization, but knowing what other civilizations, other first civilizations around the world create, they also um, erect statues and monuments to their dead rulers to to commemorate them and to deify them, to make them into gods. But these rulers, all, they may also be mighty warriors, which is often the case in ancient societies, right? The strong rule. Here's a complex, a map. And I invite all of you, as many as can, when the quarantine is over, Take a plane to Mexico and go explore. When I was 24, I took a one-way plane ride from Fresno to Guatemala City. One way, that was it. And for two months, I took buses, chicken buses, from Guatemala City back to Fresno. And it was an amazing adventure. I threw the jungle, through the Guatemalan jungle for about a month, and then the Yucatan, and all throughout Mexico, Mexico City, and um, it's, it's not very expensive to take a, a, a plane from Fresno to Guadalajara or, or De Efe um, and just explore. Go to Teotihuacan, go to Tenochtitlan, go to Chichen Itza, Palenque. Um, you can do it very cheap. Um, I invite all of you to, to do that. Go explore. So here's the map, colossal heads at the top, a tomb, um, an acropolis, which means, um, atop the city, uh, like a, um, a mound that looks over the city. We have an Acropolis in Athens, of course. That's where the word comes from. Um, and altars. Altars. Another head. Nearly 10 feet tall. And these were columns that had fallen over. And they, in back, you see these two giant heads.
This one's called grandmother, but um, of course the omen is saying call her grandmother. Um, who knows what it represents? It could be a forest, a spirit. Um, the Olmecs believe that there were four dwarves holding the earth up. This could be one of them. Sorry, I skipped ahead. Let's go back. We have these amazing mosaics from the Olmecs. And several features that we see throughout Mesoamerican history, all the way to the Aztecs, start here with the Olmecs. Pyramids, the dragon god, mosaics. We see mosaics throughout Mesoamerican history with the Olmecs, with the Maya, with the Zapotecs, with Teotihuacan culture, with the Aztecs. And it starts right here with these beautiful murals, these mosaics at within the Olmec culture. And we, we have these amazing altars. Um, they almost seem fantastic, where they seem like a, to me, they seem like a, something out of Indiana Jones movie. But this, most, most historians believe these are altars. Some believe they're not altars, that they're too tall. Um, I think they're altars, um, but I could be wrong. I think they're altars because one of the one of the very first artifacts, and in fact, we know now, um, due to a recent excavation in the Middle East, that the very oldest, the very oldest human construction, something that humans made, the very oldest one we have in existence is an altar. And what do altars allow humans to do? They allow humans to contact the gods, to get in touch with the religious realm, however, however they saw it back then, right? Because humans have always wanted to, we've always wanted to explain our existence. What are we here for? What, what does the sky mean? What is that? What, what's that great ball of fire? We know now it's a great ball of fire, but before the scientific revolution, how do you explain the sun? We're, how do you explain the moon? We, we know what they are now, before the scientific revolution, how would you explain those things? How would you explain your existence? And throughout the world, all over the world, humans create gods. There's these powerful beings that create us. And they take on various forms throughout the world. But the altar... The altar is something humans create around the world to get in touch with the gods. This happens all around the world. Ancient China, the Middle East, Mexico. And what do humans do on altars? What do you think? If altars are a window or a platform to reach the gods, what do you do on altars? Many of you go to church, right? The, the pastor will say, let's have an altar call. Well, this is what they're referring to, this ancient idea of an altar. You, you go to the altar, you, you approach God, the gods. You offer things on altars. And at this time, what do you offer on altars? You, the gods need blood. And this happens all around the world. The gods, for some reason, humans get this idea in their head, our head, that the gods need blood. Something needs to die in order for the gods to be happy. So you can perhaps imagine on this altar, someone getting their heart ripped out or their neck sliced, however they did it back at this time. This is an amazing altar. You see at top, the top of the altar, you see these two, I think they're nostrils, and you see fangs. And then emerging from either a cave or the dragon opening up his gaping mouth is a human wearing a mask. Is he emerging from the depths of the underworld? Is he being born again because the gods receive blood? You can ask yourselves these questions, what this might mean. But it's, it's powerful, isn't it? 
It represents something powerful to the Omex, whether it's rebirth from death, resurrection, right? Think about Jesus Christ, the idea of resurrection. That wasn't an original idea. Most cultures had this idea of death and resurrection. The ancient Greeks had the idea that evolved into what we know as Christianity, this idea that something dies and goes into the earth and emerges again new. And this, usually, this idea usually occurred right during springtime around the world. Perhaps it represents this here. What do you think? Powerful. I think this is just so powerful. And throughout Mesoamerican history, starting with the Olmecs, there is sacrifice. There's human sacrifice. This is amazing. Most historians believe this is a jaguar baby. And from the Olmecs onward, continue to the Aztecs, Jaguars are revered as a spiritual beings and oftentimes worshiped the jaguar. And here is perhaps a priest, a religious holy man emerging from perhaps a gaping mouth or the underworld with um, this newly born um, baby, half human, half jaguar a weird jaguar. Here is um, a artifact from La Venta, which shows, I, I believe this actually shows what's happening here. This emergent, this person emerging from the gaping jaws of, of the serpent god, which would later be called um, Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan. So we see surrounding this perhaps a priest, this person who was going into the belly of the dragon god, um, and he's emerging from it with, some, I'm not sure what that is, a lantern or incense, I'm not sure. Um, but he is traversing through this, perhaps journeying through the belly of, of the serpent god. Powerful. In all of these, this, these religious icons will, will, will travel, travel through time and emerge um, in the Chicano generation and, and be used in Chicano murals. Quetzalcoatl, if, um, if you Google, if you Google um, Chicano Park, Barrio Logan, Barrio Logan in San Diego, um, where we have these amazing Chicano murals, um, you'll see Quetzalcoatl used very often, and Olmec heads. This, these, these symbols provide a foundation for Chicano identity later on, 3,000 years later. The Chicanos take up these icons once again as a source of identity, a proud identity going back thousands of years. These are powerful gods. Here's a beautiful Olmec stone mask from about 400 to 900 to 400 BC. Four hundred BC is right before um, we have the Greek Golden Age it, that, that will emerge. Plato, Socrates, those guys. Another Olmec mass. It might be the same one. Looks like it. Beautiful. Very lifelike, right? Olmec sculpture. Nine hundred to five hundred BCE, very lifelike for the, especially for that time period. 
If you compare it to the sculpture that's being created in ancient Egypt at this time, this is far more lifelike. I hate to make comparisons like that because they're so different, but this is a very lifelike representation of a person. This is the oldest mural in Mexican history. And murals, when we think about Chicano identity, we think about murals. And this is a thread. This is an expression of the human soul, mural creation, that goes back, that's, if you, if you start with the Chicano movement, you can trace it back point by point all the way to the Olmecs. Ostotitlan. This is in a cave in Ostotitlan in Chilapa de Alvarez in Guerrero. The very first mural that's created by an ancient Mexican. I mean, this is a, re a reproduction of what's on the, on the wall. Again, we have this perhaps a spiritual leader um, surrounded by um, some kind of deity, whether it's the, the dragon god, um, some historians say an owl. I think it's a dragon god. And my guess is as good as theirs. <laughs> I think it's the first representation of Quetzalcoatl, even though they, even though they didn't call it Quetzalcoatl. I think it's the first representation we have in a painting of the dragon god. And here are places we find beyond the major urban centers of the Olmec civilization, we find artifacts. On going to uh, more more Western areas, we find artifacts of the Olmec civilization, like the cave painting here, where I have the red arrow in Ostotitlan. Try saying some of these words, right? Ostotitlan. The ball game, besides pyramids and human sacrifice, um, and mural creation and altars, and Quetzalcoatl, um, all features that will carry on in every Mesoamerican civilization after the Aztec, after, after the Olmecs, we have the ball game. This is histories of the whole world. <laughs> Mexicans create, well, of course, they weren't called Mexicans at that time, but you know what I mean. Create the first team sport. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? If you have, if your family's from Mexico, maybe your DNA goes all the way back to the Olmecs. Maybe 3,000 years ago, your 20th great-grandfather was a ball player. It's possible, right? Here's a ball hoop at Chichen Itza. And Chichen Itza is um, a Mayan urban center that flourished during, during the golden period, the classic period. I, had, I went there in my 20s during that trip I was telling you about. Um, please go there. Amazing place. And here's the ball hoop. And you see, take a look at it. You see um, the serpent god I'll carved into the ball hoop. Beautiful. It was played with a rubber ball because rubber comes from um, the rubber tree that was, that's growing in the jungle. Uh, the rainforest, and the, there's a modern type of ball game that has descended from this ball game, um, where you can't you can't use your hands, only your hips and your shoulders and your head. Um, most historians believe that perhaps this is how they played their game back then. And some historians also believe that sometimes the winners lost their heads. Very towns or um, city states would play against each other, and the winners lost. The winners who won would offer themselves to be sacrificed in honor to the gods. So it was an honor to lose your life if you won the game. Try wrapping your head around that concept. So this is the ball hoop right here, right here. See it? That's how 
That's a hiatus. Try making the rubber ball into that hoop using your, your hips. Bounce it off the wall. So I was there when I was 24. Here is it. Here's a larger view. So we're looking at this wall. Here it is here. And there would have been seating for um, the people to watch in the ball game and the Kings. This is my picture I took when I was there. I love this picture. So this picture was taken off the wall. And I have many other pictures from the, the ball um, court wall. I love this picture. It's a, it's a skull with a mohawk. It's a la elaborate headdress. And he's speaking. So this is after the Olmecs. This is during the um, classic period. And whenever you see a, an, um, a person, or in this case, a skeleton, um, with this wind coming out of their mouth, right? This, this means that they're speaking. And on either side of this, this awesome skeleton, there are ball players who have, they look like they've won the game and they're, they're bending over and their heads are being chopped off in sacrifice to the gods. And out of their heads are several um, spouts of blood and at the end of the blood are serpent heads, snake heads, really powerful carvings. They're called friezes. Um, beautiful. And I imagine at this, when it was first created, it would have been painted, perhaps reds and blues. Here's a relief scene um, of a, a ball game. A Mayan, the Mayan, a Mayan people playing um, the ball game. Beautiful. An artist representation, a Chichen Itza, of the ball game being played. And there, you can see on either side, there are grandstands where people were sitting up there, perhaps opposing kings. And perhaps during this ball game, the losers lost their heads. How would you feel about that? Maybe you, you would try not to play so hard. <laughs> Here are some sites with early ball games during the Olmec times. The first team sport in the world created by ancient Mexicans. Another major aspect of ancient Mexico is the evolution, the cultivation of maize, corn. When you bite into a corn, an elote, you're biting into history. When you dig your hands into the masa to make tamales that's made from corn, you're engaging in a practice going thousands and thousands of years. The ancient Mexicans cultivated corn that was at first like a grain of, like a, um, grain of wheat. That's how large corn was at the beginning. Eventually, over centuries and thousands of years of cultivation, um, we finally have what we, we have in our modern times. Well, so let's read this out together. It was first domesticated from a wild grass in South Central Mexico, perhaps as early as 8,000 years ago. It has a complex history of early development and dispersal. Maiz arrived in the Southwest United States around 4,000 BP, or CE, BCE, and reached Eastern North America by about 2,000 years ago. So around the time of, time of Christ, maize or corn reached in what is today in New York, Connecticut, the Eastern tribes, the tribes of the Puritans and Pilgrims first encountered um, 300 years ago. Here's an ancient cob that was found in a cave in New Mexico. Can you guess how large this is? Take a guess. How big do you think this cob is? That big. 
Amazing, isn't it? Can you imagine eating this? I mean, <laughs> a lot of different experience that you eating your lote, right? Covered in mayonnaise and spices. This would have been like a nibble, like your I'm a, <laughs> Here's a 5,000 year old maize cob from Mexico's Teocan Valley. 5,000 years old. Let's see, go back, oh, skip ahead. A husk, thousands of years old. You see down there the centimeters, it's not very large. Over time, cultivation over thousands of years, we finally got what we have today. Why does this matter in a Chicano context? Because to Chicanos, the first Chicano generation in the 1960s reached way back into Mexican history for heroes for ancient history and pulled the Olmecs forward as a source of identity and powerful identity. The, these heads in ancient times were used in a powerful context. And they're being used again by the Chicanos in a powerful context. Here we have female revolutionary fighters, soldaderas, who are, whose image is taken from the Mexican Revolution, but again pulled forward into the 1960s as an icon of resistance, sitting next to an Olmec head, separated by 3,000 years, separated by 2,000 years, but coming together to create a foundation for Chicano identity that is militant, that is powerful, that is revolutionary, that's challenging the status quo, fighting for civil rights next to an Olmec head. Once again, used in a powerful way, resurrected throughout time. Another mural, well, this first mural, sorry, is from Chicano Park in San Diego. This is from San Antonio College in Texas, Texas. Again, providing a foundation for Chicano identity. And here we see the Olmecas, right? engaging in agriculture, planting maize. The fundamental aspect of civilization is the plant, planting of crops. In this case, corn, maize, which provides a foundation for survival in civilization from the Olmecs to the Mayas, the Teotihuacan, to the Toltecs, the Zapotecs, the Aztecs. Every one of these Mesoamerican um, civilizations, their diet, the foundation of their diet was corn, maize. And we'll get to all these different icons as we go out throughout, throughout the semester. But the Olmecs provide the foundation. Modern day. What does Cesar Chavez and Huerta and Corky and the female brown berets from Santa Barbara and the walkouts, what do they all have in common? with these giant heads. This, these all provide a context, a foundation for Chicano identity. All these different icons come together in the 1960s to provide culture, cultural icon, iconography to Chicanos. See how culture works? Drawing on these, drawing from these powerful icons and religious ideas, um, going back thousands of years. Well, that wraps up our conversation about the Olmecs in the context of Chicano culture.